Welcome. Good evening, everyone. My name is Alexander Shirely. I'm uh, the executive director of Orpheus, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to our first ever virtual concert preview of our first ever virtual performance of uh, Beethoven's Incidental Music to Egmont, Opus 84, which we will premiere this Saturday uh, on October 17th at 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, we are so excited about this production. Um, it took us so many years to put this all together. It's like a thousand and thousands of pieces puzzle piece. And uh, of course, we are super excited to present this to you in Carnegie Hall, but um, that's not going to happen um, this weekend, as you all know. Um, but uh, we still uh, went ahead and uh, produced the piece and recorded it with our entire orchestra. And I'm going to stream it to you this Saturday. So Beethoven's Egmont, um, uh, the incidental music, consists of an overture and about nine additional pieces on tracks, as they're called, smaller movements and two songs. And usually, or in this country, um, you only get to hear the overture. And I would think that many of you are familiar with uh, the Egmont Overture uh, by Beethoven. Uh, the incidental music is hardly ever played. Um, and that has a lot to do with the underlying text that has to be um, narrated. But we'll get to that um, later. In any case, on Saturday, you will be able to hear the entire 50 minute piece with a brand new adaptation uh, of the text. Uh, which Orpheus actually commissioned. Um, so before we get more into uh, the detail, details uh, of our production, I'd like to introduce to you my colleagues and uh, friends on this panel tonight. So first we have our artistic director and uh, violist of Orpheus, or one of the three artistic directors, Dana Kelly. Um, Dana has been playing with Orpheus for several years as a substitute and became a full member of the orchestra about oh, a little over two years ago. And uh, to top it all off, she was elected as one of the three artistic directors of Orpheus at the end of August of this year. Well, congratulations, Dana, and welcome. Um, second, we have uh, Philip Baim. He's a playwright and a literary translator. Um, Philip is the founder of the Upstream Theatre in St. Louis, uh, which has become known for its productions of uh, mainly foreign plays. Uh, Philip is fluent in English, German and Polish and has directed plays in Poland and Slovakia. Uh, he has also translated over 30 novels and plays by German and Polish writers. And he is actually the writer and translator of our brand new and exciting adaptation of Egmond, which you will get to hear this Saturday. Welcome, Philip. Thank you. And um, last but not least, I'd like to introduce to you another special guest tonight, Mr. Elliot Forrest. Actually, I don't think Elliot doesn't need uh, much of an introduction, at least to us New Yorker classical music fans, as, as he's one of the radio hosts of New York's classical radio station 105.9 FM, also known as WQXR, or as we say, QXR. Um, Elliot uh, Forrest is also a Peabody Award winning broadcaster. He's a director, designer, and a producer. He has hosted more than 60 concerts on stage at Carnegie Hall and Elliot will be our moderator tonight, for which I'm so very grateful. Welcome, Elliot. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I guess not in my official bio, and it should be, is that I've hosted concerts for Orpheus. So uh, I'm a proud supporter of your organization and congratulations for everything you. that you've done, particularly in deciding to be strong and to do a virtual season. I know every organization uh, in, in America or around the world are deciding whether to keep busy or just lay low until we can have audiences. And you've made a bold choice, and I appreciate that. And I think your audiences will, too. Uh, we're going to have a fun time together. Uh, we're going to explore this Egmont piece uh, with some great guests, as you've heard. Uh, I did want to let people know that we will be taking your questions. If you're not familiar with the webinar format, if you uh, look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a Q&A button. You can uh, write questions and uh, we can entertain them as we go or take them at the end. It's completely up to you. So if something comes up and you'd like to ask one of our guests a question, feel free 
uh, to do so. Again, the, the event will be streamed this coming Saturday and we'll give you more information about that. Um, I think I just wanted to get the basics of it too. I, uh, announcing classical music on the radio, Alexander, before we jump into our other guests, it, it occurred to me that um, whether it was Edvard Grieg in the Peer Gint suite, uh, he would work on a play, the play would close and he would go, that's really good music. I think I'm gonna turn this into a suite. And Bizet would lar lazy <laughs> in, he'd write music for a play and the play would close and go, this is good, I'm gonna turn this in. That, that's essentially what Beethoven did in collecting this music for this whole other work. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's right. So Beethoven, um, Beethoven got to know uh, the works of Goethe a little bit and he, he became a huge fan and he was introduced to Egmont by one of his uh, friends uh, it's not quite sure who that was. I mean, there's some rumors uh, of a woman that, that told him about, about that work, Egmont. And Goethe was always intrigued by heroic figures uh, in history. I mean, he wrote his third symphony, the Eroica, um, and he initially actually dedicated it to Napoleon Bonaparte. But he scratched it out later because uh, he, he just uh, didn't like Napoleon that much anymore, what Napoleon had done, crowning himself emperor. Right. But he was always intrigued by 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 um, the fight for um, freedom, liberty, and anti-oppression, and these kind of things. And, and Egmont is a prime example. And so he got to read Egmont, and he was like, oh yeah, let's, let's write the music to Egmont. Let me go to Dana. Uh, you were part of, this is, uh, to be clear, and Alexander mentioned this, you guys recorded this. Where did, where did you go to record this? Uh, we were in an outdoor uh, band shell, I guess, in New Jersey. <laughs> Um, which one of our cellists, Eric Bartlett, found. It was very close to his house, so we're very fortunate that he was scouting out locations for us and uh, found this really special shell for us to play in. And to be clear, videotaped it. What people are going to experience on Saturday is they're going to see and hear it. You had, do you know how many cameras you had? I'm just curious. Couple? I had a, a few. Right. <laughs> I don't I remember. Oh, yes. Yeah. At least five to seven, I, I, I saw. Yeah. Five to seven. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, you know, and I've been working in a number of different organizations, including my own. And, and what I've been telling people is, you know, here we are doing live stage productions. And now we're in the TV business. That's right. And it looks, exactly. and it, and it looks like you guys are doing the same thing. Uh, you had not gathered together, Dana, as Orpheus to play for six months, eight months. What was it? Eight months, almost. Yeah. How did that feel, Dana, to get together and, and be really together as people, socially distant and appropriate with masks, but uh, to really play together again? I mean, it felt great. We were all missing each other so much over the summer. Um, and it's it was kind of strange because I think all of us were a little apprehensive about what it would be like to be distant. Since we play without a conductor, you know, we're so reliant on each other's body language and being physically close to each other and reading each other um, and just the fact that we had to be separate and wear masks i think some some of us were a little afraid that the orpheus magic wouldn't wouldn't still be there but we were all wrong it was definitely there it was electric from the first note um, so it was it was really nice to know that that what makes us all orpheus musicians always exists and the second we sit down and play together it feels like we never left. Um, so it was really special to, to be able to be together to get again. How, how many were you at the band show? Oh, goodness. Um, I want to say 18. Is that correct, Alexander? Correct. 18, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Musicians, yeah. And I'm, I'm curious as the instrumentation, I was uh, recently on a panel with Deborah Board of the president of the New York Philharmonic, and they had commissioned a study about which instruments are likely to spread COVID quicker. <laughs> that was one organization. And I was then on the board meeting of a whole nother organization where we were talking. I'd never, I never thought I'd be at a board meeting talking about spit and mucus, you know, uh, but this is what's going on in the music world and, you know, which is spreading. And so I've seen pictures and I can show a couple here where it looked like the string players, no doubt you can be masked and played, but were there wins? Were there, what was the instrumentation? We did have winds as well as strings. Um, and we made a model so that the winds could be as far away as possible, yet as close that they could be part of the group. 
Um, you know, being outdoors, we took as many precautions as we could and we followed all the guidelines so that everyone could feel as safe um, as possible. Of course, we wanted to make sure that no one was intentionally blowing their air into someone else's face. Um, you know, but but we all were tested beforehand. We all felt um, we all felt secure. Um, and like I said, we did our best with the guidelines and made sure that we were keeping each other safe um, and comfortable. And, and prior to this, prior to getting together and having this first time together, just describe what you discussed with your colleagues, your fellow players, these gig musicians that, you know, my heart goes out to uh, because uh, for the most part in a lot of, it's, a, it's for a lot of industries, you know, no playy, no checky. And uh, it's been tough for, for, for a lot of musicians. What did you guys talk about? Uh, mostly we talked about how much we missed playing with people. I mean, the, the, the financial part of it, of course, is a big, big part um, where so many of us are used to this model of go play as much as you can. And that's how we make our income. Um, and a few of us have been very lucky this summer working with other groups where um, they've been very proactive about outdoor performances. And we're so grateful that Orpheus is one of those groups that's putting on a lot of outdoor concerts. Um, but really what I think what we all miss the most this this summer and this late spring was being with our colleagues, being with our friends and, and making music together and um, how it didn't feel right to not be doing that and how it just wasn't satisfying um, to sit at home by ourselves and, and play um, or even to try to do things virtually. It wasn't the same sensation. So it was mostly about, about being together and, and the joy and the, the power that that creates. By the way, that study the New York Philharmonic did, they said, and no surprise when I thought about it, they think it's the flute. I mean, it's it flute. Might be mm -hmm. just like, right. Right. you know, this condensed, tight packed instrument full of air. And this score has a couple of those, so. Does it? Yeah, mm -hmm. All right, yeah. Play the other way, play towards New Jersey. <laughs> Um, let's go to Philip here. Uh, so your what was the first thing you got an email maybe or maybe a call from Alexander and said, hey, we're thinking about translating this. What, how did you first find out about it? Yes, Alexander contacted me. I think I think I think you found me through the German consulate. Yeah, so I was. Um, so this Egmont incidental music is, is really really unknown here and I, I mentioned it earlier I mean here in like an English speaking uh, market I'm as I'm sure you can tell from Germany and uh, I mean I've been living here long long uh, many years but but I knew about Egmont the incidental music but it's not being played here because the text the original is I mean the, the very original is by Goethe but it, it has been adapted over the years um, and and the, the the version that's usually being being performed is by a contemporary of um, Beethoven. Uh, his name is Grill Parzer, and so that's the that's the version that that that's being performed in um, in the German speaking um, areas, and that's how I knew about it. But so we were then starting to talk about Egmont for the U.S. and we were like, I was researching the text options that we had and it was just nothing that, that was in any way attractive because I mean, the original is, is hundreds of years old and it's kind of convoluted and Philip can better explain. I mean, he's, he's the, the professional here when it comes to um, couplets and, and other um, things here, but uh, it's just that it's not very attractive for an audience. Really. The story is, but but not the way it's, it's written in a way. And so I, I researched, I asked the, the president of the Max Cardi Foundation, which is a, a, a foundation that uh, that uh, supports any any um, German culture architecture in the United States and other countries. And so so she said, why? Oh, uh, you should contact the head of the German, um, the, the Goethe Institute in New York City, which I did. And they said, we have exactly the right person for you. It's Philip Bame. And so I then sent an email, like a cold call to Philip. And uh, to my surprise, he responded. No, why would that be a surprise? I mean, you get a you get an email from Orpheus, and you think, oh my heavens, this is great. And then we were able to meet. I was giving a reading in New York of something else, and so I remember we met in person, and you were able to describe the project in detail. So, and that it seemed very intriguing. 
What did uh, you know about Egmont prior to this? Well, I, I know uh, I know German literature somewhat, and I know of the play. You know, it's a it's a large play. It was a, a play that Goethe started when when he was in his late or his mid twenties, and it took him years and years to complete. Uh, and you can sense that that youthful uh, Goethe in it. Um, he was very. Uh, this was in, in the late Sturm und Drang period, and you can sense that in, in, in the play. Then he put it aside. I think it was it was seldom done during his time, and as he matured as a playwright, I think also his his uh, his own style uh, matured as well. And uh, it was performed rarely. And Grillpach, whom Alexander mentions, Austrian playwright and poet who was a good friend of Beethoven's, um, condensed it while Goethe was still alive. So this narration that Grillpasser did was something that Goethe actually was able to attend and he approved of it. He said, this is great. And I can imagine the audience back then was sitting through several hours of theater. Um, but even back then, I think it could be a little trying. And then you have the music, which, which is the idea was there is music in this play. And as Goethe, uh, as Goethe matured, the play was done not too often, but he really liked the music. So he was very much approving of Grillparzer's reduction. And of course that enabled the Beethoven to be played, as Alexander was saying. The problem is that Grillparzer wrote that uh, narration in, 18, in the 1820s. And uh, by that time, it, just, just think how much had happened between when Goethe's play was written in the late, completed in the late 1780s and then the 1820s. I mean, it's hard to imagine a more turbulent period. You know, you have the French Revolution, you have the American, you have all of these things happening in Europe. Um, and you have Napoleon. Napoleon, by that point, as Alexander had said, you know, Beethoven was at first looking up to Napoleon and then the famous uh, cutting him out of, of the. Uh, dedication for the Eroica, but Napoleon's troops were in Vienna when Beethoven was composing this, and Beethoven himself was of Flemish ancestry. So this story of a Flemish hero had a lot, had a lot of, of, of I think, uh, content for Beethoven, a lot of uh, interest uh, for Beethoven. And Maybe delve I, just a a little bit more into that story, the the character of Egmont was a was a real person. Oh yeah, a real person in the 16th century. Um, he's known as one of the heroes of the Dutch revolt. He was Flemish, a Flemish nobleman. Uh, and the interesting thing for me about the play is Egmont himself as a hero, he wasn't a hothead, he wasn't a revolutionary. At the time, this, these were the Spanish Netherlands. So the King of Spain, the famous uh, Philip II, King of Spain, was in possession of these, these Spanish Netherlands. And Egmont was very loyal to the king. He was also a Catholic at a time when Reformation was making inroads in the Dutch provinces. And he was not only loyal to the king, he was a hero. He had fought for the Spanish crown very successfully against the French. Um, he, he, was, he was very much a, a loyal uh, person. Uh, and the way that the history evolved, they, the, the Spanish didn't like the Reformation influences. They sent, they had a regent there. For a while, things seemed to be uh, Egmont seemed to be able to negotiate these differences diplomatically, but as time went on, it became very clear that Spain didn't want to have anything to do with any tolerance of, of reformative uh, religion. And there was also a personal uh, vendetta, this thing, the Duke of Alba, who figures uh, in Goethe's, he's the, the evil, the villain in Goethe's drama, uh, had it, it was a personal enemy of, of Egmont's. And so the king dispatched Alva to the Netherlands. And uh, that that was the beginning of the end. And he arrested Egmont and another uh, count 
uh, and accused them of, of treason. And then they were beheaded in the uh, main square of Brussels in uh, 1568, I think. Um, so, so the story is very interesting. You have someone who was actually trying to work within the system, trying, he was a, what we call a conservative uh, person today. Um, he went to the king of Spain. The king didn't, didn't grant his request, he, but he believed that his own loyalty would, would save him. He, he, he thought that somehow um, it wouldn't come to that. And yet, lo and behold, so this, so we see the, the, the ugly face of tyranny dis disavowing any rational approach. Um, and another corollary, which interests me, and I think also would be very interesting to talk to, to both the musicians and Alexander about this, the relevance for today in this, in this story, Egmont's fellow citizens stand by and let these things happen. Only, only the love interest, Clerchen, in the in the piece, is really taking his side and doing something about it. And of course, in the play, she commits suicide. But the other citizens just sound, just stand there. So he's surrounded by fecklessness. Now, does this sound relevant for today? <laughs> Some things never change. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, le let me ask you if I understand it right. You did an, an adaptation of an adaptation of the original. Is that? That's right. I, 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 Alexander hired me to translate this. And I think, well, this is, if I translate this, it's already overblown enough. And, and so I tried to keep the form because it's written in metered verse. And that form is important because also the form is so important to the music and the music is heroic. This verse was intended to be heroic, but of course, in those days, drama was declaimed heroically. Now it, it's, it's already, the language is already over the top. And I'm so glad that, that Lev Schreiber is taking this down into an interior moment, uh, but the, the language itself has to have this form, in my opinion. So the challenge was to preserve this meter and rhyme and that would somehow play with the music. Uh, another interesting problem is that some of, the, some of the, the narration is actually incorporated into the music. So I had to work with the score to make sure that the, the syllables would, would fit the musical phrasing uh, for the final bits. Dana, um, Phillips talked about the contemporary. Uh, Dana, uh, uh, Phillips talked about the contemporary relevance of this story. What What did you find for yourself as a contemporary relevance? Um, well, I think just the you know everything that Phillips talking about about standing up for a belief, and it's it's interesting that Egmont was what we would consider a conservative today and a conservative activist who was trying to work within the system. And I think that um, as we look at, you know, the year that we've had and the what we've all gone through individually and as Americans and as a world, um, how different people have used different attempts to try to make things better and what has worked, what hasn't worked. Um, and so it's it's kind of as a musician, I think playing this music, it's a, it's a reminder of um, history repeating itself and, and how we are always um, challenged to look for ways to find the right path, find a better way for all of us. And, you know, what, what is considered conservatism 200 years ago was considered liberalism now. And, you know, how everyone's views have changed, um, how we see ourselves in this context. It's just, and then to play a, a piece of music that was written over 200 years ago, um, but still brings up these same emotions uh, is really fascinating, I think. Did, had you played this music before? Maybe just the overture? Only the overture. And that's the only thing I'd ever heard before also. And uh, how did What's you, 
Go ahead, Philip. No, for, for Dana, I would be interested because the other thing about the music and, and the play, it ends with a sort of looking into the future, right? With that, that Ziga symphony, this victorious symphony at the end. What was that like when you were rehearsing, when you get to that point? Do you feel the progress of that? Do you feel it's a future speaking? I'd like to, to think so. <laughs> um, I think musically speaking, it's, it's interesting since I, since I didn't know the rest of the incidental music other than the overture, in the overture, of course, everything is compact and we get all the emotional content from the beginning of the, um, the torment of the play to the final, um, the final exhalation and, um, you know, uh, exclamation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it happens in such a tight time frame, And I, I feel like it's, it's not as satisfying, but then once you play the whole piece and you, we get to play that, that amazing final music once more, it feels much different because we've gone through this journey. Um, and it definitely, I think it, it definitely speaks to the play. It speaks to, um, Egmont's path. It, it felt like we'd achieved something as an orchestra once we've gotten to that place that I that, didn't feel before. Exactly. Great. Yeah. Thank you. I'm always fascinated by this, Dana. Um, once I found out that uh, Beethoven started to become deaf around his second symphony, uh, knowing that he wrote seven more after that, and that's just the symphonies, uh, sort of thinking about the fact that I'm, you know, to a certain part, I guess, is that by the time he got to the ninth, he only heard it in his head, not out loud. Where, where does Egmont fall in, in the realm of that deafness for, uh, for Beethoven? Uh, well, he wrote this around the same time as the Fifth Symphony, uh, which we all know is one of the most famous works of art where um, the artist is reckoning with his fate. Um, so I would say that I'm not exactly sure on the timeline of his deafness where this lies, but he's definitely dealing with some health issues, deafness. Um, he also dealt with a lot of stomach issues. So um, I think that this is another example of him uh, kind of shaking his fist at the world saying, uh, I wish I could change things. And the way that I can make the biggest impact as me, Beethoven is writing down these, these emotions into the music and, and making sure that my beliefs are heard and that they are, that they stay, that they're part of history and that I'm, I'm not going to give in to something that I don't believe in. It, about the deafness, it's an interesting point with Grillpatzer. Grillpatzer was, was a boy and lived in the same, for a little while, in the same house as, as Beethoven. I believe that his mother had some run-in with Beethoven uh, because Beethoven caught her listening to, to him play. Uh, interesting little tidbit there. Uh, we will be, uh, I can, take your questions. If you're in the audience with us for this webinar, we're more than happy to do that. We've got one coming in now. Um, we have a, an anonymous attendee. Uh, since it's during a uh, pandemic, how different was it to prepare for this performance in comparison to the past? Uh, we, we talked about how you did the performance. How did the rehearsals help and, and what were the big differences? The rehearsals were pretty much the same. Um, like I said before, once we sat down, it felt like we were back to normal. Um, and we got pretty used to the distance quickly. Um, there was a lot more uh, reliance on little eye movements, of course, especially for the string players. Um, I think the, the, the biggest thing that I noticed was how different it felt to perform without an audience. Um, we had a few members of our staff there. Alexander was there, of course, and we had the uh, video team there. But um, the audience brings such an energy and such a different atmosphere um, to the performance. And that is something that I think we're, we all miss and are trying, find, to try, trying to find ways to replicate over these virtual uh, performances even if it is performed live, just that immediate feedback is not there. So um, that's something I think we, we are all still grappling with. Uh, Alexander, was, I, I, yeah, 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 if I may add, I was, I oh, yeah. was, uh, 
you know, what usually is a huge advantage of Orpheus, which is not having a conductor and everyone like playing chamber music on stage and being so collaborative and, and engaged and like evolved and proud and all, all these things, you know, for me, it was a little um, a worry, I want to say, because, you know, when you have to seat them apart six feet and, and all of a sudden like this 18 piece chamber orchestra becomes, you know, space wise, a symphony orchestra without a central figure they can all focus on like the conductor i was really worried that the rehearsal process i mean they're the best of the best of course and they're used to you know playing without a conductor but i thought that maybe the rehearsal process would take much much longer but it didn't it was really really surprising and, and overwhelming actually to see it and um, um impressive simply impressive how it all came together and um i mean it's a hard piece and and as dana said and i'm sure that's true for for most if not all of the musicians um that they had never played it before um the overture yeah but not not the other movements and uh then of course you know we had a soloist soprano soloist karen slack sang the songs and leif schreiber was our um, narrator and you know busy people even you know in the in, in during a pandemic and it was hard to you know we, they couldn't be there for all every um rehearsal so we had to put it together in really short time but uh really wonderful these songs so impressive yeah. And, you know, the other thing I wanted to add earlier was like, um, we had hired uh, Leif Schreiber uh, because we felt like he's the right person, he has the right charisma, and uh, um, he, he'd do a great job. And um, we had hired him for Carnegie Hall, right? <laughs> and so we had to tell him that we, we'd be in a band show in Hillsdale, New Jersey. Instead, I was like, oh, he's probably not going to come out and do it. But um, he he decided to. And I said uh, when, he, when he arrived, um, there said, so what made you finally agree to, you know, do it, take it on? And he said, you know, I read the text over the summer and or I read the story over the summer and there's just so much dignity in it. And isn't that what we all need right now or more of? And it was like, good for you, man. You know, that's exactly, that's exactly why we're doing it. I mean, that's the point here. And it was so great, you know, getting to know him and, and, and why, why he committed to this because i mean as i said I mean, he's, he's so busy right now he's in italy filming and it's just like yeah it's a perfect perfect fit really alexander i'm also curious um the process and leading to a virtual season uh i mean again i'm involved right. in a lot of different nonprofits right now all many for live on stage the mission is live on stage and um and then I, every organization I know sat down usually with their boards and their members and said, you know, are we going to sit back? Or are we going to do something? Talk to us about the, the process and the ultimate decision to, to, to do a virtual season. Well, I mean, you know, we're, I mean, we go week by week, really, because things or well, at first, at least we did, because, you know, we, we close our office mid March and like, yeah, you know, we'll see each other in like a couple of months again. And then, of course, it's still dragging on and it's not getting much better. And um, so we had to adapt as everyone else, too. Um, we decided early on that we uh, we could be nimble and we could be flexible and could find ways to stay um, present in the music world. And we started small with like um, um, chamber music well we did some zoom uh, you know split screen like that's the first thing that appeared everywhere then uh, we did that too and then but but then at some point it, it got old for us at least and we thought no we have to bring the musicians together uh, in small ensembles outdoors of course uh, in a safe way we did that but then we felt that this Egmont project you know it was really taxing and uh, i mean over the years it took us so long and i know that it was really hard on philip too because it's really it's not an easy um it it's not an easy text to to first translate but then also in a way that that, that people will understand what this is all about you know and so and it also took him some some real time and then i thought no i just don't want to cancel that program it's our opening night you know we have wonderful subscribers and i hope many of them are are here at this event uh, uh listening and uh we thought we we want to do something for them it's just it's it's our job and we promised to to do something uh pandemic or not and so um i have to really congratulate my colleagues my my staff because they they just did everything they could to locate a venue 
Um, one of the musicians, Eric Bartlett, was was uh, was very critical in this too because he lives out in New Jersey and um, find a venue, you know, sc scout it out, and then find a video team, find an audio team, and make this, you know, and and collaborate with a doctor. So we have like testing two days before all the musicians, not just rapid tests, but the real test, everything, and uh, read about all you know what's needed to keep the musicians safe and and healthy during rehearsals and concert. And you mentioned earlier, you know, the studies about which instrument and you know it's the, the, the the biggest spreader of of um, aerosols and yeah it is the flute and you would think the trumpet because it's the loudest but no you know if you when you blow through a trumpet it slows down the air and what comes out of the at the end it's very it's 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 not flying fast or far right but but the flute because you know you blow over it so half the air or a third of the air goes right above it and the rest goes through it that's actually the <laughs> that's for a pandemic, the worst instrument. Uh, otherwise, it's most of the and one of the most beautiful ones. But so what I what I heard from my colleagues in Europe is that they are placing the flute on stage now, where usually the the tuba and the trombones are sitting, like way in the back in the corner. So and, and I, it's it's like yeah, it's it, it wouldn't be because such you a can story, get the tuba. Yes, you can get the tuba player sick. As a former tuba player, <laughs> no. I completely object to this. <laughs> yes, sure. Um, but anyhow, and we, yeah, we had our, you know, our flute player and we're playing uh, the Egmont, not in the original Beethoven um, orchestration. We, we found a, a reduction that's uh, by Andreas Tarkman. He's a German composer and um, um, arranger. And he's, he's wonderful. Berlin Philharmonic plays uh, his works too. And it's like, we found this Egmont um, um, adaptation by Tarkman, which is, you know, single winds only instead of double winds, like not just one flute versus uh, two flutes. And so we're able to place our flute player, the wonderful Liz Mann, uh, within a plexiglass kind of uh, wow. um, walls. And yeah, it, you know, we did everything we could and everyone, I think everyone felt really safe and, and taken care of and really kudos to our staff. I mean, it's just unbelievable what went in. And so, Amazing. so yeah, but again, I mean, what made you decide on doing that? It was really that we felt it's a great piece we have to do. We felt we need to do something for our patrons, for our subscribers, for our friends, for our donors, everyone. We can't just hide. And as you know, I mean, the larger orchestras like the Met New York Phil, you know, it's harder for them. They have a different system, different setup. And it's just canceled the entire season. That's, you know, we just didn't want to do that. We, we were like, no, right. let's do everything we can throw all the manpower we have um, behind this and and see what happens. And, um, and we're very, very proud of it. I mean, I think it's a great production, really. Right. Um, Philip, talk about your challenges uh, in the translation. And um, m maybe you talked about this heroic decla declaration. I remember in my theater classes that things were far more presentational at right. one point. And you get an actor like Liev Schreiber, who I've seen on Broadway, who's very, very personal, very intimate. Uh, talk Correct. about writing and then, and then maybe ha how it worked with him. Well, the as I mentioned, the, it was important to keep the form. And so I was actually trying to rhyme a little more consistently than Grillparzer at the same time with the language that is accessible to us and that isn't overly archaic. And yet you can't avoid some degree of archaicism when you're talking about a crossbow match, you know, taking place, which is how the, how, how the piece begins. Um, and it is set at a certain time we don't want to we don't want to be in the language of that time we want to be able to kind of move in and out and the narrator and, and i'm sure that if uh, schreiber did a fantastic job modulating because there I, I was trying to put little asides in there that would allow the narrator to be a presence and not just be claiming some in, uh, uh, verse. Uh, and I think that may have come come through from what Alexander was saying, since I wasn't at rehearsals, yeah, even, even more than I could have possibly imagined uh, because of his ability to uh, bring things into an interior, uh, you know, personal embodiment um, as, as an actor. Uh, but that, that, that is a challenge, uh, preserving enough of the period and making it accessible. It's a, it's a tight rope walk uh, to some degree. So uh, 
and at the same time, what is going to work with the music, you know, because the music is so, it, it is, it's Beethoven, it's structured. It's, it's, we, we want to feel the heroic aspect of this, uh, of this story, um, but at the same time, bring it enough to life that we can identify with it, that it can, we can relate, just as Dana, when you were talking about that, that arc that you felt uh, as, you know, as the orchestra was playing, that we could all feel the arc of the story through the music and the narration, uh, rather than have some kind of cardboard text being the claim. I want to remind you that uh, if you're just now joining us or joined us in process, you can click the uh, Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and ask our panelists questions if you like. Uh, one of our attendees wants to know, um, it was something you said, I sort of got the hint too. Does this mean you haven't seen the the production yet, Phil? Oh, I, I was hoping to go to Jersey, to, but, but you know, here I am in Texas and so I couldn't, couldn't quite see it. So I haven't seen it yet. I'm looking forward to it. And yes, I will be seeing it for the first time on Saturday night. With everybody else. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Dana, talk to us uh, just a little bit more about your fellow musicians at Orpheus. I mean, I have been to many of your concerts. I've hosted one or two, and um, they're just an outstanding group of people. Where do they come from? Tell us uh, what, what you want us to know about Orpheus musicians. See, how much can I talk up my colleagues? <laughs> um, and the structure, too. For those who don't know, I think the fact that you're both conductorless and... Um, and that there's sort of a, a community aspect to the organization of how decisions are made, I think would be interesting for people. Definitely. Yeah, so um, Orpheus was started in 1972 as a musician-led ensemble, um, and that is still the way it operates today. So all the musicians are extremely um, devoted to how the organization functions and um, the process that we go through as a group. Um, and I think that's what makes Orpheus really special is that every single person, whether they have an administrative role or not at a current time, um, they care deeply about what we're playing, how we're playing it, where we're playing it, why we're playing that. Um, and that makes the rehearsal process really much more engaging, I'd say. Um, when we have musicians meetings, you can tell that everyone is very interested in all the aspects of the orchestra. I'm currently uh, serving in the role of one of the artistic directors, and there are three of us um, who kind of handle different pillars of the organization. So I'm the artistic coordinator. Um, there's another violinist, Miho Segusa, who is the personnel coordinator. And the third artistic director is another violist named Christoph Hubner, who is the program coordinator. And so the three of us are musicians first, but we work with the staff um, to create the artistic vision for the group. And I think what's also really special about the way we're structured is that everything's always rotating. So I just started my uh, position this fall and I will serve for three years. But um, each artistic director is on a different three-year cycle. So next summer, there'll be another opening. And the summer after that, there'll be a third opening. So everyone is always contributing. Um, and also, it gives us a lot of opportunity for fresh ideas, um, for fresh conversations, and to make sure that every musician's voice is, is heard and respected and valued. But at the moment, you have the, the viola party taking over. That's great. <laughs> you do, that's right. It's going to be all violas from now on. <laughs> uh, Dana, you're also at the Manus School. Just quickly, too, a word about teaching remotely and how that's going with uh, students uh, during this pandemic. Yep, I just started teaching at Manus this fall, um, which is very exciting. Um, and also, many of the members of Orpheus are, are teachers at the conservatories in New York, New Jersey. Um, and I believe, if not everyone, most everyone is teaching uh, virtually through Zoom. And that's been um, a big learning curve, I think, for all of us. We're so used to um, being hands-on, being right next to people. Um, music, you know, is so much about connection and conversation 
and uh, intimacy in so many ways and trying to communicate that through the screen it is something we're all learning. Um, uh, I know people especially who have many students have have tried to adapt their teaching styles um, for depending on who it is but you know there's there's so many ex external things we have to deal with now like is your internet connection working <laughs> and that was never a thing before you know so uh, but I know some some people for example who live in New York City and teach at Stony Brook University and they are not too upset about not having to make that commute anymore so that's one <laughs> upside it's to all of this yeah, I I totally understand about the no commute. I'm I put more mileage on my bicycle than I have my car since the lockdown. Um, we we've just got a little bit of time left. A couple of more questions. Um, I wanted to know if someone could tell us a little more about Karen Slack, who she is, and her involvement in this. Is that Alexander? Yeah, I can, yeah, uh, yeah. We're looking for a soprano that has this um, dramatic voice even though the songs are they're very um what can i say more like a pensive or um like there's a poignant back huh yeah. there, there's a poignancy in the yeah so you have to be able to to have a lot of emotion in in your voice and in your in your in your interpretation without getting loud or like in your face and i think she yeah, we listened to her. We we knew about her, of course. We listened to her, um, and we thought she'd be she'd be the right person. And then, yeah, I mean, same thing. We were worried that she wouldn't be able to do it um, because we had to pre-record it. So the concert date, which is which would have been this Saturday, and it will be this Saturday for all of you, but we had to pre-record it and then move it up. And uh, we were worried that she she didn't be able to do it, but uh, she, she was. So she came in and uh, um, and she was from. She come from Philadelphia, so which is a state that we didn't have to worry about quarantine for two weeks um, prior to getting together with our musicians, all that sort of stuff. I mean, all things you know we had to consider, of course, and um, so it worked out really well. I mean, she and she loved the piece, and I think she she just I, she she got it just like Leah Schreiber did. She just totally got it. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> Will you remind people how they can uh, watch the piece? Yeah, so the easiest out? for all of you would be if you go to our website, which is orpheusnyc.org, um, click on tickets and concerts, um, and the event is called Speaking Truth to Power. The way it works is so we're we're hosting this, or this is being hosted on um, on Idagio's global concert hall platform, which is a global streaming platform, and um that's where you can buy your tickets i think it's through eventbrite or one of these ticket um uh, agencies and uh you have to sign up for a but it's free so, so you just have to sign up and then you get your ticket and then you can watch us and it starts on saturday october 17th at 8 p.m it's about an hour long 50 minutes 55 minutes or so mr show uh, very exciting i can't wait really i i on it i mean i've seen it when we recorded it um, but I haven't seen the recording itself yet. Um, very, very curious, I have to say. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, you know, when you, when you record outdoors and you have to take into consideration the weather, which you can't control, obviously, and then you have uh, cars or trucks nearby. And <laughs> funny side story, of course, the day we wanted to record, they decided to pave an entire block, like just, just a few roads away from us. Like <laughs> our general manager, Caroline, just went over and made them stop like the entire, you know, <laughs> they just moved to some other quadrant of the town to which they wanted to pave also. But I mean, these are the kind of things you're, you know, you're not used to deal with this because, you know, you usually just go to concert hall or, you know, Carnegie, wherever you go. And it's like everything works and it's there. And uh, um, it was, it's just like, it was just nerve wracking. And then we watched the weather report and it was just getting darker and darker and <laughs> more blue for the rain. But uh, we got, we got so lucky. So in fact, we had one of the rehearsal days we had to move indoor and we moved into this vast, massive hall so where everyone could spread out and um just to make sure we have enough ventilation space and everything but then for the for the recording we were lucky enough to 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 do it outside it's just beautiful you know the, the 
I mean, it sounds good. You know, we, we chose a band shell that has good acoustics. I mean, that's why it's a band shell, obviously, but um, we, um, it, it really sounded terrific live. And I can only imagine that, that the, the recording is even better because we had microphones for everyone. And so they pick up more, more direct. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited about this. And, and you all should really tell your friends because it's something to, to be looking forward to. It's, it's it unique. must have been exciting and, for the passers-by when you were recording it. Yeah. Yeah. So we had to cordon off the park, but we had some people, you know, going under and over and, and just standing there. And then once they realized, oh, my God, it's Leif Schreiber, the actor that we know him, Ray Donovan, uh, with the cell phones. And, you know, of course, it's uh, very exciting for the people of Hillside, New Jersey, but um, Hillsdale, New Jersey, sorry. And um, yeah, so it it's a great production. You really, you know, and, and the other goal, I mean, I, I told you earlier, I mentioned earlier that I had known the piece. I actually, in my previous life as a cellist, I, I had uh, played the piece, the entire incidental music, and I knew about it. And I always, so, I mean, I thought it was fantastic. I was like, why is nobody playing it here? And um, I, I, I understand now why, but with this new text or adaptation, it's really our hope that that the other American orchestras will will take it on and do it. It's it's the music. It's just breathtaking. It's beautiful, highly dramatic, and and the entire story is just 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 wonderful. So, so we you know Orpheus has always been a torchbearer of innovation, um, and this just fits right in. I mean, something completely new, even though it's old, right? It's hundreds of years old, Beethoven, um, but it's it's going to be a new a new masterwork for the for the concert repertoire. It begins streaming October 17th and people can access it through the 22nd. And I, I would just like to say that um, while you're online and getting tickets to access the, the concert, uh, donate to, uh, to Orpheus. Uh, I mean, you've heard this time and time again, any organization like this uh, cannot survive off of ticket sales alone. None of them can. It, it, it's, uh, it, it really needs people to set up, uh, step up and, and do what they can and, and as we say uh, at New York Public Radio, uh, it, it doesn't really matter how much you give. It only matters that you give. Um, something as small as uh, five or ten thousand dollars goes really far these days. So um, <laughs> right. give what you can. Um, any final comments? Well, thank you all for um, joining this panel with me, Philip. Uh, great job with the the adaptation. Thank you for it's inviting me, and thank you yeah. for having me and it's a pleasure to, to work with all of you of course and, and being here tonight i mean it's just just uh just um wonderful um hang on there's one more question should we uh, what link do you other? use to get to the program they want to know go to orpheusnyc.org right dot org slash tickets and concerts slash speaking truth to power but if you just go on our website and then tickets and concerts you see it speaking truth to power you see a photo of you have schreiber karen slack uh Egmont. Just click on it. You'll find it. It's um, it's uh, it's easy. And maybe the um, folks, thank you. Um, Maddie and those folks can uh, put the link right in the chat section too here. Right, right. Um, thanks, Dana, for joining us tonight, and uh, congratulations again, you know, artistic director for the next three years. Wonderful having you there too. And Elliot, as always, what a pleasure. Um, thank you for making time and helping us moderating this uh, event. Thanks so I much, and uh, yeah. So I'll see you all um, Saturday, I hope. Great. All right, look Thank forward you so to much. it. Look forward. All right, have a good Thank night, you. everyone. All right, bye-bye.